this is a Q&A video. I should hope I don't have to explain that, and if for some bizarre reason you're watching this without knowing my channel, then I'm a counsellor who sometimes makes videos about that, mainly makes videos about film analysis, and then also just generally shares thoughts about stuff. <laughs> Why am I doing a Q&A now and not before or not at a reasonable milestone? Well, I've never thought of it. <laughs> and my girlfriend suggested it, so here we are. I put out a community poll asking for your questions. I didn't read any of the comments, but asked her to go through and compile the best ones, possibly rewording them, I think, to make it a little clearer. But that way, it can be a bit more fresh as I answer them and not like I've pre-planned too much. Uh, although I did actually give it a skim read yesterday, but not anything too major, I, I couldn't help it. Anyway, that's just a quick disclaimer, I suppose. There were a lot of comments, so obviously I won't be able to answer all of them, and I thought it was better to remove your usernames from the questions in case there's some of you that aren't comfortable with that. You know, it's better not to risk it. So that's the setup, and let's just get started. What made you want to start YouTube even though you were working as a therapist? Well, that's <laughs> the story of this channel, and some of you might already know this. Um, I wasn't a counsellor when I began the channel. I was in training, I think right at the end of it. This channel was never a plan or something I intended to do. It kind of happened by accident out of my occasional <laughs> dumb tendency I have to write long YouTube comments on things. Um, the I Will End You've Seen from Good Will Hunting turned up in my recommended videos, so I watched it and I'd seen the film before, but quite a few years back and having done some of my training now I thought oh this is quite interesting how this scene does make sense from a counselling standpoint even if it is fictional um, and so I, I just wrote a long comment on the video kind of saying that and kind of having fun myself realising things as I wrote the comment and I, I guess vaguely analysing it um, <laughs> I don't know why but anyway, I wrote it on my old YouTube account that's connected to an old email address, so I didn't see any notifications in reply to that comment until I accidentally signed into it several months later. And there were tons of likes, a ton of supportive comments telling me I should make a proper video about the scene, so I thought, yeah, that sounds fun, and <laughs> I did. Um, so in short, I think I started this channel because A, <laughs> people told me to, and B, it sounded fun, and I, I guess C, I've just always enjoyed finding meaning in things, and this gives me an excuse to do that. Is cereal soup? <laughs> this is the second question on the list. Um, no, it is not. No, cereal is not a soup. Is that an actual debate that's going on? Um, cereal comes in a box, it's a dried food, you commonly add it to a bowl of milk, but the dried food itself isn't a soup. It's <laughs> It's like, um, croutons go in soup, but aren't the soup itself. Or anchovies go on pizza, but they aren't pizza, they're fish. <laughs> it's that kind of thing. <clears throat> Why did you become interested in doing the job you currently do? Um, hmm. Because I was coming to the end of my undergraduate degree, which was in literature, and I still hadn't become the famous writer I wanted to become. <laughs> And I have always wanted to do something to help people in some kind of way, or have a positive impact somewhere. Um, and I'd had a counsellor myself for two years when I was about 18, and it really did help me turn my life around, I think. Um, it doesn't always do that for people, and not so quickly, but it did for me, and I suppose I, suppose I wanted to give that back to someone else. Um, beyond that wishy-washy answer, I don't exactly know. I... No, when I finished my undergraduate, I didn't feel like going into a big job yet. I know I wanted to delay it a bit longer, um, and a master's gave me an excuse to do that, but I didn't want to do a literature one. I'd kind of gotten run down with literature by that point. And counselling just seemed like a good thing. A good degree I could do that led into a job afterwards, um, and something I was interested in. I, I don't know. <laughs> Again, it wasn't really something I particularly thought through. I just sort of did it, and it suited me perfectly. What is your favourite story from any medium? Well, I'd choose a book, I think, because books you can get more invested in, they're much longer and in-depth. Um, and I only read it once, and I read it at a crucial time in my life, so it might not mean as much to me whenever I read it again. I might not feel as positive. I don't know. I might do. Um, but The Baron in the Trees by Italo Calvino, a story about a kid in 
the 1700s, I think, who has a bit of a rebellion against his parents by climbing out of the window and hiding up in the trees of a forest. And he makes what seems like a childish vow to never set foot on the earth again, but to spend the rest of his life up in the trees and this forest, climbing between them and sleeping up there and things. Um, and it's a vow he does keep for the rest of his life, and the story is then about his life. I, I just find that idea really wonderful. Um, it's a very fun, but also very touching book. What advice would you give for people who are thinking about studying to become a therapist after school? Uh, <laughs> I'll give you the uncommon advice, um, specifically because it's not the sort of thing you'll hear most people say. I think you can get other advice elsewhere <laughs> from better people than me. Um, I would say do not get too caught up in the science. Um, when I went into my training, I knew absolutely nothing about psychology. Like I said, my undergrad was in literature and I was worried that would be a big disadvantage. Um, but my tutor told me in my interview for the course that it was actually an advantage because I'd approach the work and people less scientifically and more emotionally and more um, empathetically. You know, literature is a degree about finding meaning or empathising with characters or drawing out symbolism and metaphors that are naturally always there unconsciously in all of our behaviour. So that does suit counselling very well um, and the science and theory is obviously important and I did learn a lot of it through the training and I'm, st I'm still studying obviously now but um, don't get lost in that at the expense of the emotion I think. You have to approach the work from a human standpoint first I suppose. Can therapy serve as a somewhat quicker less painful path towards self-knowledge? Uh, Yes, I think it can, but I also don't think self-knowledge is the aim of therapy so much as self-awareness, I suppose, or just having a better handle on your emotions. Um, it's a fitting follow-on question from the last one, I suppose, because you don't want therapy to just be intellectualization about your problems and behaviour. You want it to actually hit your heart because that's what really leads to change. So, yes, I, I do think it can lead to self-knowledge. Talk a lot about your feelings, and you do get a better understanding of how you behave and things. Um, but a, that's not exactly the aim, and b, I'd also caveat that by saying it's it's not the only way. It's I don't know if it's always the quickest or the least painful. Sometimes I don't think it is. Um, I think growth comes about as a general collection of lots of aspects in your life: some good, some bad, some lessons, some to do with the environments or experiences, all sorts. Um, I think I've used the analogy of like a gym before, but you think <laughs> physically for your health, going to the gym is obviously a good thing that helps, but there's also diets, other exercise outside of the gym, all of these sorts of things. In the same way to do with mental health, counselling is obviously a very good thing, but it's not <laughs> like the only thing, I guess. Do you have any pets? Yeah, um, we used to have a house rabbit called Dylan. We had two, actually, originally. Um, but I made a video about Dylan when he died last year. Now we have a dog called Bob, who's the most exhausting dog I've ever come across, but also the sweetest. Will you ever reveal your face? Well, there's two reasons for why I haven't shown my face before. Maybe three. The big one is for the anonymity of my work. Um, you know that feeling when you're a kid and you randomly see one of your teachers out in public and how awkward that feels? Imagine if you saw your counsellor out in public. And then imagine if it wasn't seeing them in public, it was discovering they had a YouTube channel with tons of videos talking about counselling. <laughs> that would feel so so strange and it might distract from the work and affect your relationship um, I mean it might not but ethically counsellors are supposed to be a bit careful about their online presence because it just keeps things safer so I've never given away my surname never shown my face or home or specified where I live or work beyond just mentioning the county um, the second and third reasons are the sheer effort of having to buy a camera, set it up, make myself presentable every time I need to record a video. <laughs> I can't be bothered with that. Um, so I'd say as things are, it's not likely I'll do a face reveal. If some way into the future where I'm no longer working as a counsellor, maybe, but I have no plans to stop counselling. I feel like I've barely gotten started with it. 
Do you like to read? If so, what books are your favourite? Yes, uh, I do, <laughs> but I'm too lazy to read that often anymore. I think doing a literature degree kind of burned me out a bit and having to read too many books too quickly. Um, I, Yeah, I've read a lot of literature. Um, I like a lot of philosophy books nowadays and novels and therapy, everything. <laughs> a bit of everything. Um, though I should really read more. I think the last book I read was The Northern Lights and I'm currently listening to an audiobook of The Two Towers. Do you play any instruments? Yeah, I used to play the drums. Um, there's a lot of other instruments I've always wanted to learn, particularly the piano, but I've never had the patience. Drums is mostly just hitting things. <laughs> you know, as long as it's in time, it basically sounds all right. I did it in a few bands and I like the music we made. I think it's good, but I'm no special drummer by any stretch of the imagination. What's your favorite ending to a story? Um, Maybe if I thought about this more, I'd find um, an answer I prefer. But right now, I'd probably say Jojo Rabbit's ending. That left me feeling so energised the first time I saw it, and the second time I saw it. it <laughs> it's a great ending. And there's a follow-on question to that one that reads, How do you think that story endings impact our lives, which are usually bereft of finite endings, except death? Um, well, I made a video a long time back about the importance of endings in stories, so I don't know if that's where this question comes from, um, but yeah, a video about how closure at the end of stories can give us an emotional experience of endings that could be applied to other situations in our lives, so I definitely think they can impact us, yes. I think good endings are very important and it's a great shame TV shows keep getting cancelled and deny us that closure, however, I don't think our lives are bereft of endings at all. I think um, we have them in most things, we just don't consciously realise it a lot of the time. But I mean there are things like you know endings in relationships, jobs, friendships, moving home is always a surprisingly big ending. Um, finishing a project is a big ending, reaching the weekends, months or different terms. Um, I'm just listing things. <laughs> I reckon if we really thought about it though we could probably roughly draw some categories or like changes or development out of each ending or cycle. I reckon we could find narratives and <laughs> character arcs for ourselves in these things. Um, I guess I'm saying there's endless cycles going on and new beginnings and endings every day and a lot of the time we don't like to think about them um, but they're there and I think stories yeah I think they can teach us how to I think they can teach us emotionally what a good experience of an ending can be like. If you could name a boat that you own, what would you name it? <laughs> I've stopped for a little bit to think about this one, and it's a very hard question because I'm not, I'm not a witty person, or I'm not a comedian. I think you can tell that from my channel. Um, I think I just name it in massive red caps lock lettering. Dermatologists hate her. <laughs> There's no clever pun behind it, it's, it's just that. That's as good as I can do for that answer, I'm sorry. If you didn't have to worry about money, what would you do all day? Um, well, I'd travel more, or at all, <laughs> and I'd try to do positive things to help people, but otherwise, probably mostly the same sort of stuff I already do. You know, follow my creative passions, write, make videos, that kind of stuff. Um, that's not an interesting answer, though. I might invest money in my big idea I've had to make indoor snow arenas that instead of like indoor places for skiing or snowboarding is an indoor place for snowball fights because that would be awesome. None of you are allowed to steal that idea though, okay? okay? It, it, that's my idea. How did you know what you wanted to be when you grew up? Did this ever change in the young adult phase or did you always know what you wanted to do? Um. Well, I am unusual there, and I don't know why really, I've just always wanted to be a writer or an author or the things to do with that. Um, I don't know if I'm lucky in that sense to have always had this clear ambition, or if it's unlucky because tying myself to this one thing means it's a struggle to settle for anything else, and what happens if I fail? Um, and I have tried to settle down and forget about writing before, I <laughs> really did try. And maybe I'll just have to settle down, maybe I won't have a choice someday, but in all my efforts so far I can't. What is your goal with your channel? Not just in terms of numbers, but do you do this to educate, inspire, get people to think? Well I know this will sound forced, but I 
honestly don't know. <laughs> it's not to educate or inspire. I, I do know that. I'd feel so uncomfortable if I was directly trying to teach anything because I don't feel qualified to do that. I'd feel so awkward about it. You know, the, the Goodwill Hunting therapy videos, although I slap the word therapist in the title and things because it helps with views, I also feel uncomfortable doing that because those videos cannot be like some emotional lecture. I don't want to present myself as the smart therapist you're supposed to learn from and agree with because I cannot come across like this esteemed therapist dispensing wisdom. A, I'm not that. <laughs> and B, even if I was that, it would be very disingenuous. It, I think it has to be a bit rambling and make clear that you're not always supposed to agree with me and just be my thoughts, my personal feelings on things. If I ever veer into making arguments that I want you to agree with and to convince you of things, then that would be wrong. It wouldn't be accurate, I don't think. Um, so I don't do anything for those reasons, and I think if you try to educate or inspire, you probably achieve it much less. Um, <laughs> I feel strange about when people say in the comments and things that I have inspired them with certain stuff as well. Like, it's a very nice feeling and a very nice compliment that I really do appreciate, but I also feel like I don't... I not, not deserve it, just it feels... I feel like does that mean I'm not presenting my proper self if I've suddenly become inspirational because I'm just an ordinary person, I'm not an inspiring person, you know? Um, and I don't want to become disingenuous here. But basically I analyse movies because I feel curious and interested to do that for myself and I kind of figure the stuff out for myself by making the videos and I then share my thoughts and personal opinions that actually often change a lot later anyway. But yeah, this channel's just meant to be a humble little tree of thoughts that you can pluck from, like an apple, if you want. Um, you don't have to, they might not be all good. Apple trees aren't trying to make tasty fruit for humans, they're just getting on with their own thing. <laughs> and this should be the same, I think. I hope that makes sense. Um, I just have to try and be as I am and hope whoever that person is is of interest to you um are there topics or things that you really want to make videos on but haven't yes <laughs> the one thing i have no problem with for this channel is having enough ideas i always assumed that would be a struggle when i started you know to find topics every week but it, it, it's not there's always enough ideas i think because i have to think of them it's always going on in the back of my mind the problem instead is always having enough time in the week to turn those ideas into an actual video that takes a long time um but i do like have a lot of half finished analysis scripts on my laptop for videos there's about 20 word documents just on my desktop um or even recorded audio that i just then haven't been bothered to make into a video uh I suppose that's not quite your question though. Um, there is stuff I'd like to one day do videos on, but I either haven't watched the film yet, or show or whatever it is, or haven't really sat down to work on it. Um, off the top of my head, I'd like to make some more videos on The Sopranos someday, some proper in-depth ones. I'd like to make videos about Lords of the Rings. Um, obviously, I want to finish all the current series I'm doing. I want to rewatch Joker someday and then see Taxi Driver and King of Comedy and other similar stories about similar characters and maybe make something there, but I, I don't know yet. I haven't really had the space to think it through. Really, what I need to do is see more films because for someone who's accidentally become a film analysis YouTuber, I've seen an embarrassingly low amount of films. So much I often get teased about it. It's, it's embarrassing how few I've seen. What question would you want to be asked and how would you answer it? That's just giving me space for a shameless opportunity to indulge. <laughs> so I'd want to be asked what's the best thing I've ever done and I'd tell you without a shadow of a doubt that it was in year 12 English class when I scrunched up this half eaten bit of cake in the tin foil the slice had come in. It might have been this cake I think our English teacher made us as a tree only she'd put 12 eggs in it or something mad and it just tasted horrendous with <laughs> horrible texture um, but whatever was left of it I scrunched back up into this tinfoil ball and my seat was in one corner of the room and the bin was in the corner completely opposite and I threw the cake for the bin it wasn't an easy shot at all I had to lean back behind someone else's chair which 
messed my aim and it hit that extending hinge above the door you sometimes get where it then bounced down off this girl's head bounced off her onto the very corner of her table and then bounced from there into the bin and it was the middle of the lesson and I went completely mental. <laughs> it's a story I was telling everybody I met for weeks after that and no one was as impressed as they should have been. Some of them didn't believe me but it, it <laughs> it's the best thing I've ever done. Is there a specific philosophy that you hold in your life as in a specific way you live by thinking? Probably not particularly, no. Um, I mean, I've read a lot of philosophy and spirituality stuff, so it's all a big influence, I think. Bits from everywhere. Um, I read a lot of Marcus Aurelius and Seneca in my late teens, for example. I'm very much influenced by Taoism, by Rumi, uh, Buddhism, different mythologies of the world. I think people forget how much wisdom there is in, like, pagan religions. I don't know what my philosophies are exactly, I don't, you know, you don't tend to sit down and think about them as a list, you just have certain feelings and I reckon some of my beliefs and ideas have come up at points throughout my videos and will probably continue to. That's a terrible answer, I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't know. I honestly don't know. Who or what inspires your poetry? Have you ever read yours at a club or anything? No, I have not. <laughs> I think I'd feel far too awkward about it to ever join a club. Also, I think I'd worry those sort of clubs would take themselves really seriously. I, I, I don't know, I've never been. Um, I, I just think I'd be much more comfortable down the pub acting like an idiot than being a smart poetry club man. But for example, I've got a collection of poems I've put together. Um, some of them are on this channel, I think, as videos, but only three people other than me have ever seen the entire collection so far, so that tells you something about my awkwardness of sharing things. Nature inspires my poetry though, I think you can see Rumi in some of my conversational ones, uh, Shelley, Keats, Byron are some of my favourite poets alongside T.S. Eliot, but I don't, I don't really know what inspires them, I, I guess it's different for each poem, it's normally like a certain thing I see or just happen to imagine that looks cool and symbolically feels like an interesting thing and that's like a, then a seed that the rest of the poem grows outwards beyond. Uh, I don't know how to answer this question without accidentally sounding very abstract and pretentious. <laughs> I don't often write poetry at all. I just, I'll just i just sometimes go through a week or two of being into writing a load and write like five or ten poems. Yeah. What is the most important life lesson you have learnt? Uh, I don't know if you really learn them as lessons, you kind of just develop things over time and it's not until you think back you've realised that there's been a change, but I'd say to not take myself so seriously. That insecure 13 year old boy who worried about the gel in his hair and criticised himself over a lot of dumb decisions, it doesn't matter. I'm still basically stupid, everyone is basically stupid and do endless stupid things in stupid ways and that's probably what makes humanity such an endlessly lovable thing, like a dog you can't stay mad at. <laughs> um, I try not to take my faults so seriously anymore but laugh at them with affection. Uh, I don't know how that change happens, I don't know if I'll always feel like that but it feels more healthy. Do you ever have times where you wish to stop existing? Not death, but simply being erased from existence. What do you do about it if yes? Well, I've definitely had that. Yeah, um, I was once in a place where that was a regular feeling, but I also don't know what advice I could really give because I'm not entirely sure what did change for me. Um, I have a narrative about it, but I feel like that's a narrative I've half invented for myself to make sense of it rather than necessarily the truth. I also always feel uncomfortable giving advice and these sorts of questions really because well, I don't tend to give much advice in my work anyway, it's more asking the questions and helping them work it through so I think I'd, I'd say it's very difficult. Caring about ourselves in some ways I guess can be the hardest thing to care about um, but if it's hard to care about yourself and hard to believe you deserve a space in existence. I would say spend time with people who either do or could care about you, even if you don't necessarily believe it yet. I mean, counselling definitely helped me when I needed it, talking to people helped me, but also so did playing Last of Us online with my best friend every night. He reminded me I can be someone 
worth spending time with. That was an important experience in itself, that you can have fun with somebody else still. Uh, you don't want to force yourself to have fun, you don't want to be false about it, but just to experience that you can still have those sort of interactions. So, I don't know, sometimes you do want to talk about things, sometimes you don't, I think you need both, but when we find it hard to care about ourselves, we do very quickly decide, well, clearly no one else cares about me either, and we start isolating ourselves to make that statement seem more true. So yeah, I'd say reach out to people. Um, doesn't have to be a big emotional talk. You might want that, you might not. Might just be someone to have a laugh with, but find people to regularly meet up with or talk on the phone with or whatever. Something regular and consistent. Top five movies and TV shows, favorite characters. Um, well, bearing in mind this is me thinking now, there will inevitably be great choices I've forgotten or can't think of at the moment that I would want to add later, but as it is, the movies go spirited away, Cornetto Trilogy because I'm not going to list the three films individually and have them take up three spaces, Shawshank Redemption, The Fall, Laputa Castle in the Sky. TV would go The Ricky Gervais Show or just Cole Pilkington content in general. Um, Band of Brothers, Breaking Bad, Taskmaster, and I might have said The Simpsons for its heyday, only the endless bad seasons stringing it out kind of ruins my memory a bit, so I'll give that spot to a show I haven't watched in years, but does still hold a cosy place in my heart as the thing the teenage me watched when he felt down. Scrubs. And characters I don't know, that requires too much thinking, I'm not gonna bother, I'm sorry. When did you really get a sense of who you are and what you wanted to be or do in this world? Well, being an author was always the goal, but who I am, I still don't know. I made a video on the Queen's Gambit to the conclusion, Beth's ambition to be a chess player doesn't sum her up as wanting to be an author doesn't sum me up, it's the clear hope I seem to have given myself somehow because that way life feels less uncertain, but it is still completely uncertain. Training to become a counsellor half happens by accident, YouTube was never an intention, and yet now it feels like one of the most important things in my life that I want to keep doing forever. And I think we try too hard to decide what we want to be, forgetting that we're something already, and maybe if we let ourselves enjoy the journey, um, things will largely basically turn out the way they're supposed to. I still will always want to be a writer, but who I am for the moment, I'm happy with. Mostly. <laughs> How do you have such good taste in music and movies? Do I? <laughs> As I've already established, the amount of films I've watched is embarrassingly low, and the amount of music is even lower, because the only time I really listen to music properly is in the car when I'm driving. Um, the rest of the time I go for non-distracting background music while I work, so... I've got a lot of lo-fi playlists I've amassed, and trip-hop mixes, and world music. I, I love traditional music from different cultures as well. Um, all of that, however, means there's so many bands, and singers, and rappers, and things, and, and movies out there um, that I know are really good, but I've just never gotten around to listening to, or giving them a watch, or whatever yet. And it's a problem. <laughs> so I suppose I'm saying... If the tiny amount of music and films and everything else I've seen and heard all happen to be good ones that give me good taste, then it's complete luck. <laughs> Favourite type of bread? Nothing fancy, um, this will make me sound very unsophisticated. Simple, sliced, white breads, thick doorstop size. I'm, <laughs> I'm not that keen on hard breads, um, baguettes in particular just seem difficult and impractical to eat. For a nation that gave themselves the medal of best cuisine in the world, um, the French invention of the baguette, assuming it's French, I don't know. I, I'd guess it is, but if it is, it's a stupid one. <laughs> I've said it. How do you feel about garden gnomes? Ugly, horrendously tacky, and I love them for that. <laughs> um, same with Christmas decorations, the beautiful looking ones are never quite as nice and cosy as the tacky ones. I think garden gnomes are so, so tacky, but that's kind of what's nice about them. What keeps you going every day? Having projects, um, basically. <laughs> I think there's nothing harder to maintain than motivation for personal or creative projects, but 
if you can keep it going, then I think that kind of keeps the rest of you going. Or at least that's how it is to me. I don't know. I've always just been weirdly compelled. Um, what are some of the reckless things you did as a teenager? What do you think of them now? Uh, <laughs> ran through a field of wheat. <laughs> no. Um, I don't think I was ever too bad. I did some bad things and got in some fights, broke some stuff, typical things. Um, I suppose when I was particularly young, there's even a few occasions where there's stuff I did that was probably bullying. Not often, just one or two memories I have where I did stuff and then realised a bit later on that they were kind of hurt by it and then I felt really guilty about it. Um, I expect everyone's got moments like that and hopefully they're things they learn from as a kid. Um, most of my stories are getting in trouble for harmless things though, like standing next to a door with shredded newspaper and throwing it whenever two people exited the building, like congratulating them for getting married, or playing volleyball in a computer room. So I don't know if I was reckless really, I just liked having a bit of a laugh and just pushing things slightly, I guess. I can't really think of the most dangerous examples, and there certainly were some like, um, unsafe nights, <laughs> but they're long stories. A small just memory I've always quite liked was this little sort of common room they had for sixth formers at school. It wasn't the proper common room but like a second space next to the school reception that had this coffee machine in it and this is just a sort of typical thing I would do is like I randomly stabbed a couple of holes in a few of the cups and then hid them back in the stack. And then um, I was in there several weeks later when the deputy, or he might have been the head teacher by that point, I can't remember, um, took one of the cups made himself some coffee, pulled it away and had it spill right down him through the holes I'd stabbed. <laughs> and I was in there trying my best not to laugh and it was made even funnier because one of the reception staff was helping him clear it up um, while he stood there ranting deliberately loud about how it broke rule whatever of some handbook and how the person responsible has grounds to be expelled and <laughs> I'm sure he was saying it loudly because he knew it was me and he was trying to scare me or something. I'm, I'm sure of that, but it was funny as hell. Um, what I think about it, um, I mean, again, that's not a reckless example I've given there, but in general, what I think is that I got in a lot of trouble for stupid things most days at school. If it was serious things or stuff that caused harm or was malicious, I'd feel very differently about it, but I wouldn't shame myself for those things because I, I don't think I'd need to. I'd, I'd know I'm a different person now shaming myself would be falling into the trap of suggesting that's still who I am. Um, but as I was, I basically just got in trouble for innocent, harmless stuff. Provided it is harmless, I think those experiences are positive and have a lot to do with learning to, like, express ourselves, to experience freedom in ways you don't get when you're older, experiencing rebellion, uh, consequences, just what being reckless itself feels like, because there's there's times in our lives where we need to take risks and there's always a thin line but really I think misbehaving and being recklessness isn't always a bad thing. I think school should be about more than just being good and getting good grades. So I guess it's good to see the fun side of reckless stuff provided there's a limit. <laughs> How is it you seem so well balanced when narrating a video but so hopelessly neurotic when typing? Neurotic? <laughs> You could have said witty or hilarious, but you went with neurotic. Great. Uh, I, I assume you're referring to my dumb community posts. I don't know why, I just always feel so awkward making community posts, because they feel like they're holding up a trumpet and announcing myself to the world, and just like a very vain sort of thing to be doing. Look everyone, I've made a video, I'm making a video, pay attention to me sort of thing. <laughs> you know, um, it's good to make them, they're important. I know that, I don't have any problem with anyone else doing them, I don't think it's vain when people make them at all, but it, it, I just feel it a bit when I do it, and I think I react to that by half taking the mick out of my own community posts as I write them. It's not particularly funny, it's pathetic humour that amuses me and no one else, but that's most of my humour, most <laughs> of my jokes are just to amuse me. Um, but it stops me feeling so self-aggrandized, so that's good. Um, and there's not much humor in my videos themselves, I guess, because I think it distracts from a lot of the points I'm making, and I wouldn't want to force the humor if it's not sincere, and 
also while I might feel upbeat, I don't tend to feel in a jokey sort of mood when I'm basically sitting right where I am now on my own in a small room trying not to move too much because it makes the chair creak. You don't feel like cracking too many jokes in that sort of situation. How do you not take home your client's issues with you and maintain a healthy distance whilst maintaining empathy and sincerity? Very good question. I don't know. Um, I think I'm naturally quite good at that sort of thing and I think having YouTube and writing helps me because it's like that becomes my focus when I get home. I can put other stuff out of my mind a bit. Um, apart from obviously when I need to sit down and reflect. Really, I suppose I think trust is the key thing. Trusting that the clients will be okay. Trusting they can cope and can manage or at least that they will be able to. You want them to trust themselves in that fact too. So it's good to kind of have that trust for them that whilst their world may be immensely hard you've done all you can do in offering them the space you have and making sure you're a hundred percent present for them during their set time but yeah that you can have trust and confidence they'll manage the rest of their week when they're at home or whatever obviously it's different when there's safeguarding issues that put them in danger and things um but you know everybody does have their own lives to live and you have to trust them to be able to do that if you can then i think you do naturally worry a bit less how do you find the motivation to go through all of your schooling that's such a long time ago for me now <laughs> uh, no idea I, I don't think i always did find the motivation sometimes i felt no motivation whatsoever but then still somehow went on i'd say similar to my earlier question whatever it was don't take it too seriously. It isn't all about behaving well and having good grades. It's also about learning to experience social environments, managing difficult emotional situations, um, discovering your passions, and all that kind of stuff you can do when you don't take it too seriously and free yourself up. Um, so yeah, I, I'd just say don't stress about homework. Don't stress about when you get in trouble or about being unpopular, um, those kind of things. It's fine. I will counter that by saying whilst I did absolutely everything I could to get away with not doing homework and I often zoned out most lessons and sat doodling, um, but that when it came down to revision I did revise a lot. I figured out what I needed to revise. I don't mean wasting endless hours highlighting unnecessary facts or whatever else, but figured out what's worth learning and then learning it or doing mock papers or researching the sort of essay questions that I could get asked, imagining how I would answer them, then memorising that well enough that if I got a similar essay question in the exam I could adapt the plan to fit it. That's my advice, this is why I don't like giving advice. Mess about for the entirety of your school life, don't worry about it, just work hard when it comes to revision. Um, and I think revision is a good experience or lesson to learn from in terms of getting better at self-motivation for stuff you can't be bothered with or find boring and breaking down tons of information that feels daunting. It's a difficult but good experience to learn from, even if you end up with terrible grades, um, which never matter as much as you think. Just enjoy it, <laughs> that's my advice. What inspires you to look for much deeper meaning in a form of art that many of us take for granted? YouTube views. <laughs> no, I, I don't know. Um, may, I think I'm just used to doing it. My literature degree was about finding meaning. I try to write stories that are fun but also meaningful. I do a job that's about finding meaning or understanding expression, so maybe it's that. I guess I just feel curious about things. <laughs> and this isn't like I do this whenever I watch anything. I only really am in that analytical mindset. Either if I watch a film on my own and pause it at points to think, which I don't like doing on a first viewing, but sometimes do, um, or when I've finished watching it and I'm then just daydreaming along with thoughts about the film later in the day or whatever, the rest of the times I just sit and enjoy movies and let myself switch off for a little, um, but I am also curious about them because it's part of my passion and this channel gives me an outlet. Um, that gives me motivation to think and bother analysing films where I wouldn't necessarily have done it much before. So I guess it's just that. There's an endless amount of great art in the world that I find fascinating and 
doing this channel gives me an excuse to really stop and consider exactly what it is that fascinates me about a particular piece of art. There's actually a question here asking if I always analyse things or if I switch off slash how do I switch off. I think I've kind of answered that already there but the best way to switch off I think is to watch a film with somebody else. Then you're not thinking as much, you're just enjoying the experience and enjoying their company. What is the best way to become a better writer? Uh, well I mean there's the obvious things you get told all the time like read more books and just write more, <laughs> enjoy practicing it, don't worry too much about the end result, just do it a lot. Um, I think that was the best thing for me that I knew from a young age I wasn't a good enough writer yet but if I just keep writing eventually I would be. Um, so I think that's important, not to expect everything you write to be the winning novel or whatever. But what what is the best way to become a better writer? Um, I think to not expect yourself to be brilliant. I think you write better when you're not trying to be a genius, but you're just enjoying the writing. I think learning to have fun with it and being a bit more playful in your mindset can be good. Um, hmm. Finish the projects you start so much time I spent where I'd get like halfway through run then give up because it gets difficult and start a new one I think it's better to finish it because you learn a lot from that experience of the conclusion even if you have to end up finishing it and wrapping it up much earlier than you intended that's my advice if finishing a massive novel feels too much at the moment maybe start with finishing short stories finishing collections of short stories finishing collections of poetry finishing small plays, I don't know. Um, I certainly found it hard when I first started trying to write an epic fantasy novel before I'd really managed anything else at the time. I couldn't finish that. I think, yeah, if you want to get better, write things and finish them and learn from that experience as a whole. And also don't always expect everyone else to um, critique your writing for you or to give you the best advice about what works and don't. I think you have to kind of get good at reading it back yourself and learning these things. Um, seeing what doesn't work, seeing what you feel happy with. Those are all the questions I've got here on this list. A lot of them are really interesting questions. I've been talking for a long time. I'll probably edit a lot of this down. <laughs> you might be able to hear but my throat is going a little bit. That's how long I've been talking. I hope you enjoyed this, um, maybe I'll do another one someday, who knows. As it is, like the video if you liked it, comment whatever thoughts, whatever you think about my answers, um, whatever else, and yeah, hopefully see you next time. And a special thank you goes to Devin, David Kling, Darren Bredoglatter, Kestrel, Arwen, Stephen Legg, Samara Salsi, Sharakov2814, Joshua C. Follier and Chad Bramwell. Thank you.